What do peace, security, human rights, and development have in common? Nasser Abdulaziz Al Nasser, the UN High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations, knows. He'll discuss it next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Is it possible to make today's contentious world more peaceful and inclusive? That is the challenge for Nasser Abdulaziz Al Nasser, the UN High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations. Welcome to the show, Mr. Al Nasser. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Tell us about this organization, the Alliance for Civilizations. It sounds like it has all kinds of opportunities and possibilities. What, what is its mission? Well, uh, the Alliance uh, of Civilizations created or the initiative came uh, after the September uh, 11th, 2001 as reaction of, from the fear of uh, clash of civilizations. So the United Nations General Assembly welcomed the idea and uh, handed it over to the Secretary General to see how they can restructure and create a UN body uh, as a soft power tool to prevent conflicts and diffuse tensions, especially on the area of culture, religious, uh, and promote dialogue uh, among societies and nations. And so this is a relatively young organization. That's right, yes. Um, and, and now you are at the helm. Do you have certain priorities that you have brought to the position that well, have changed or expanded its role? Yeah, of course, when, uh, when the, uh, the Alliance of Civilizations being created uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, the Secretary General appointed a group of uh, eminent personalities called the High Group, High Level Group, which they worked, they selected them from all regions. They worked uh, very hard and then they come up with a high-level <coughs> high report, which is the best way for the alliance to be effective, uh, to focus at that time on four pillars, uh, youth, education, migration, and media. Uh, it's very important what we see around, what's happening around the world today is uh, lack of education, uh, marginalized, the youth became marginalized in different societies where they became easy, easy target for those uh, radical uh, groups to engage them in, uh, in terrorist issue. Uh, uh, when I been, uh, when I took over this organization a year and a half ago, I said the four pillars is great. But we need more. Uh, we need also to, to focus on arts, sport, uh, music, anything, bring people mm -hmm. together. Uh, and uh, so today we have many pillars to work with uh, in order to achieve our mission. You talked about media, and I know you have a global expert feature uh, that is available to those who are seeking uh, informed opinion on a variety of issues. Could you tell us how that works? Yes, we now, uh, media, it's one of our important, uh, we have uh, uh, many seminars engaging young journalists uh, from Europe, from Middle East. Uh, uh, since uh, I took over, we organize three seminars <coughs> New York, in Geneva, and Paris uh, to 
be to produce programs that w will help uh, and be more positive than neg negative and uh, especially for the youth uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, we are uh, uh, working with other organizations as well to to uh, uh, the role of media today on the world especially uh, social media that's really sometimes they play negative mm. role uh, I can say most of the time <laughs> and some of the time positive and we see uh, I think this need uh, really cooperation between <coughs> governments between civil societies between uh, international organization how we can work collectively and try to 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 reduce this negative uh, atmosphere what we see today uh, so uh, it's a very challenging uh, mission very challenging issue as well uh, uh. tell us a little bit more about how you use music and sports and other avenues to encourage discussion and cooperation. I'm, I'm very excited to hear that you've added those elements. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> now we, when, when I propose uh, the sport, music, arts to the, to the uh, meeting, the first meeting, which I just took over, people welcome the idea. You see, uh, Sport bring people from different backgrounds, from different culture, from different religious, from different language. But they are together enjoying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And now we try to work with the uh, Oly uh, Olympic organization. We are uh, working with some countries who are really promoting sport, uh, as they say, sport for peace. Uh, uh, we try to work with them uh, as well uh, in uh, promoting, <coughs> you know, uh, culture of peace. Uh, it's, 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 it's one of our main thing, but if you add uh, sport for peace, uh, it will be, I think, more effective. Uh, so uh, we uh, convene a few meetings at the UN, also bringing people from different backgrounds and discussing how we can use sport to create peace, mm -hmm. especially in this world, what we see today with all this uh, turmoil, problems, uh, uh, conflicts. Yeah. Now, aside from your current work, you've had an illustrious diplomatic career in more capacities than, than I could name, and you've recently written a book about one part of that experience. Can you tell us a little bit about your new book? Yeah, sure. Well, actually, uh, uh, just uh, we launched the book uh, at the uh, in, uh, NYU, uh, 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 the NYU Press uh, published uh, the book. <coughs> uh, this is as a result of my uh, uh, my presidency for the United Nations General Assembly 66th session, which. Uh, 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 I took over in the year 2011 and 2012. And very critical year, full of challenges. You know, if we look at uh, what so-called Arab Spring or Arab mm -hmm. Awakening, uh, which uh, unfortunately we thought that was great to bring freedom and uh, democracy for the Middle East and uh, to enhance the rule of flow, but that uh, uh, spring uh, get lost and drift to many, many conflicts, as we witness today in Syria, and Iraq, in Yemen, and Libya. Uh, so uh, then, uh, I. I uh, I enhance the role of the General Assembly on the, in the area of mediation because <coughs> using uh, 
mediation uh, to to bring peace it's very uh, important because sometimes use of force uh, doesn't uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, peace might create more uh, but I think using soft power tool to prevent conflicts and diffuse tensions around the world and in that case uh, I ask the Secretary General of the United Nations Mr. Ban Ki-moon uh, to uh, uh, to travel together in joint mission. So we went to Libya after the, the, the changing the regime of Gaddafi and uh, you know to give assurance to the Libyan that you suffered a lot during that dictatorship uh, time. We are here to bring you support. We encourage you to look forward for a better future and learn from the past and uh, anything we can do for you in the United Nations we will be very happy we listen to officials civil societies uh, young people religious people what their concern are uh, uh, as a message uh, of support then we travel to Somalia which was you know also another big crisis what I say always, this country uh, been forget by the international community. And uh, the international community, they have a responsible uh, commitment uh, toward this country. We see the piracy on the Red Sea, and the whole world run and put a lot of money to fight the piracy. But let's go to the, to the, to the roots. Why? Uh, why this has happened. We should, instead of spending billions of dollars to fight piracy, we can go to, to the roots of this cause, uh, to Somalia and try to uh, help them, uh, try to support them, try to educate them in order to take them away from what they are uh, suffering from. Uh, so this is when also we get involved in the financial crisis, which usually um, General Assembly, they don't uh, before uh, on this issue. It's only dealt by World Bank, IMF, and the G20. So uh, I convene a high-level meetings. Head of state, head of government came. We produced a paper. We said, well, this is a guideline, and I think the General Assembly is responsible for uh, any financial crisis in the world because it represents the whole uh, community. Uh, it represents 193 countries. Uh, and today when we, when we say financial crisis happen in Europe or in the US or somewhere else, it uh, affects the whole world. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have big responsibility to discuss and come up with some solutions in the General Assembly. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we get uh, involved uh, in, uh, you know, when uh, when uh, uh, being elected, I came up with uh, four pillars to focus on uh, during the presidency, which is first mediation, then natural disaster, then United Nations uh, Security Council reform, uh, and the last one, sustainable development. Uh, so we got uh, involved uh, with many uh, important issues. So after I finished, I looked, I said, if I don't do something about what's happened during that time, it will be lost, not for me, also for the old collective uh, work that we, we did together. So that's why this book uh, called One Year at the Helm of the United Nations General Assembly and the Vision for 21 Century. It sounds like the issues of peace, security, education, and development are all inextricably linked. Yes. And to, to have peace and security, you have to have the others happening at the same time. Uh, is it possible to bring all four of those together all over the world 
and how realistically how long would that take if we were to, to really devote our efforts to it <clears throat> you see I will first start uh, when some people cricket uh, you know they 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 say United Nations organization is not very effective I will say that's wrong it's the UN system is a driven system by member states when there is a commitment and we implement what we agreed upon something good happen sometime we meet we agree we have a commitment but we don't implement that's why we fail and I think uh, security and stability uh, need a lot of work a lot of commitment because if we try to achieve a great development uh, like what we have what we had in year 2000 at the UN during the MDGs the Millennium Goals uh, which we promise we committed that by 2015 we'll achieve uh, a real develop sustainable development mm -hmm. and to begin with preventing and reducing the poverty around the world especially in area like Africa and other places so uh, 2015 it's only mm -hmm. one year from mm -hmm. from now and we look back we achieved very little mm -hmm. why because we failed to implement that commitment and if we don't do that uh, now the United Nations are engaging on what beyond uh, 2015 what called post uh, uh, 2015 agenda so if if we don't implement what we agreed upon the same thing will happen and then we see more crisis because if we don't have sustainable development we will have a crisis and the crisis will affect our security and stability in the world. You've had the unique opportunity of presiding over the General Assembly and of serving on the Security Council. Yes. And so you understand both the mediation side and the, the force side. Um, when is force necessary? And you also made reference to Security Council reform. I'd be interested in hearing right. some of the ideas that came out of that discussion. Yes. <coughs> I served, uh, uh, I was representing uh, my country, Qatar, to the uh, Security Council for the year 2006 and seven as non-permanent uh, uh, member. You know, we just served for two years. Uh, and uh, I always see challenges when I take uh, 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 responsibility, you know, like uh, during that two years we had many uh, problems, uh, uh, war in Lebanon, uh, Iran, nuclear issue, Darfur, of course, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and other issues, Africa, you know, Africa it's 60% uh, of the work of the Security Council is focused on Africa uh, conflicts. Try to uh, deal with that and bring peace to that region. Uh, so I saw use of force under Chapter 7, and I saw uh, the, the role of Security Council is very important in our. But when they established of the UN uh, almost 70 years ago at that time they create this organization with a small number of, of, of uh, countries uh, and the Security Council as well uh, and 70 years from that time to that time 50 countries today the United Nations uh, represent 193 countries 
the world, I think we live today in a, 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 in a global village. Uh, so how to have a very effective uh, United Nations Security Council? We have to reform that uh, council. Uh, extra members, uh, how we talk about the issue of uh, veto, is it? Is it uh, uh, important today for using, uh, or we we don't need to use veto? How many permanent? Uh, we have five permanent seats uh, today. <coughs> we see other merging power in the world. It's not like 60 or 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring more. Uh, countries who are can help uh, the United Nations uh, Security Council to bring peace and stability uh, and we increase the number of non-permanent so this issue been debating and was going on almost 16 17 years uh, and we have two three groups are working to like uh, G4 uh, then uh, the uh, another organization uh, is con uh, uh, united for consensus, and then you have the five permanent members who can. <coughs> it's very challenging and very difficult issue. Uh, I know to bring consensus on how to have a good reform and have more effective council today to deal with all the crises and conflicts and bring peace, uh, it's essential and it's timely and I think uh, we need to see a larger council uh, uh, and bring more uh, members who can really help uh, the UN. Uh, we, uh, uh, so this is what I, I got involved of course, that was one of my pillar as a president of General Assembly which I convene almost eight uh, meetings and retreats, and uh, we still need a lot of work, I think. But it's very important to have uh, a reform for Security Council. How do you expand the number of permanent members of the Security Council in, in a fair way? The structure we have now reflects the reality at the end of World War II, and we have the United States, two European countries, one country that is European and Asian and China. Um, how do you develop a Security Council that is more representative of the rest of the world? Yeah, uh, I think we need, in my opinion, uh, the issue of the veto first is, is important. Do we need to keep the veto or not? And then you cannot have extra permanent members without veto. And the other five, they have the veto. So, right. I mean, we need here very effective counsel to, 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 to handle all this sensitive and dangerous uh, conflicts in the world. I think we want to see Africa to be represented, Latin America to be represented, also some of European countries and Asia. Uh, and if we don't have a fair uh, representation on the council, the council will not uh, do, not, not very large council, but with fair representation. Uh, it's, I think it's a must and it's very important. Great, well thank you for joining us today, Mr. Al Nasser. Thank you so much. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia, we'll see you next time.